have Mr. Barfield make it, before we, before we take questions, <laughs> let's have him make his, uh, whatever statement he wants to make, and then he'll take questions, okay? And he needs no introduction because you all know his yeah. story, right? Yeah. My name is John Barfield, right? Yeah. Okay. And I'm very happy to be here today and to be a part of this program. Uh, it's good to see you all. You're beautiful. And uh, let's talk. Questions? Yes. Uh, by the way, um, you tell us your name if you're in Act 1 before you ask your question. Younger Barfield. Okay. Oh my. <laughs> well, so you want to know a little about Young Barfield? Yeah. Or would he be like silly or would he be more serious? Well, I think he was a little more serious. And as I talk to you, you'll, you'll find out why. Well, can I tell you a story about little Johnny Barfield first? Yeah. Well, he was born in 19. Alabama, and uh, uh, we, my folks were very poor, and we lived in a place called Colton Quarters, which was, uh, which was uh, the, the colored section of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. In those days, in this country, there was a lot of prejudice, and we lived in the South. And when I was about four years old, or five years old, I, I became very sick. My folks didn't know what the problem was. Uh, all they know is that whatever they did, my condition got worse and worse, and I got sicker and sicker. And this one day, they, my father said, I, it, we thought you were going to die because you were so sick. So they had moved my bed to the, to the front room of the house so that it was cooler there. We didn't have air conditioning in those days. And I was laying there, and my mother and my father and my grandmother and father and people from the community had came there, and they were all there uh, because my father said we were praying and crying and using homemade medicines to do whatever we could to keep you alive. And he said, Johnny, we thought every breath was going to be your last breath. And out of nowhere, two angels came, and they came to my house. And I'll tell you why I called them angels. My father said there were two white ladies. They walked down the street, and they walked up on our front porch, and they walked into the house without ringing the doorbell. I didn't, I, yeah, we didn't have bells without knocking on the door. And they walked up to my bed, and they said to my mother and father, you have a very sick baby here. And one of the ladies took out a pencil and wrote an address on it and gave it to my father and said, run as fast as you can run and give this to the man that lives there. So my father didn't have a car, because we were very poor. So my father ran all the way to the white section of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and he got to this house and he knocked on the door. And the man invited him in. My father told him why he came. The man got up and packed a bag, and he got on his motorcycle and he rode as fast as he could to my house. And my father said, uh, he always laughed when he told me this, he said, I didn't have a car, but I got there about the same time he got there. So I think my father knew which backyards to run through and where the dogs were, <laughs> and where they weren't. So uh, this man came, and he was white also. He came up to my bed, and he said to my mother and my father and my grandparents, you have a very sick baby here. And uh, he said to my, my mother, he said, would you make me a pot of strong black coffee? And my mother did, and this man sit beside my bed all night. And my father said the next morning my fever had broken. And the reason for that was he was a doctor and he knew what to do. And so I, uh, I asked my father, I said, Daddy, who were, those, who were those two women? And he said, Johnny, we don't know who they were. He said, nobody had ever seen those women before. And he said, and no one has ever seen them since. He said, we came to the conclusion that these were two angels that God had sent to save your life. And then he said, Johnny, God must have a purpose for your life. Amen. And uh, I've never forgotten that story. But God has a purpose for all of our lives. 
He has a purpose for all of our lives. Let me tell you another story about a rich young man that was an heir prince. His name was Abu Ben Adams. Can you say that? Abu Ben Adams. Okay. And Abu Ben Adams was the son of a rich ruler in Persia many years ago. And he had everything that life could afford him. He had the finest horses. He had the finest homes, he wore the finest jewelry, he had the finest clothes. He had everything that a person could wish because his father was a ruler. And uh, he thought that his life was just perfect. But one day, he was uh, sleeping. And he was awakened in the middle of the night by a big flash of light. And he woke up and he saw an angel sitting in his room writing. And he said, what are you writing? And the angel said, the names of those that love the Lord. And this young ruler said, is my name there? And the angel said, no, your name is not there. The next day, this young man went hunting with his father. They hunted with a horse. And he was riding through the woods, and out of the bushes jumped the fox. And he spurred his horse on to chase the fox. And he heard a voice that says, Abraham, Abraham, were you born to do this? And he stopped, because he was surprised to hear this voice, because he didn't see anyone. But then he spurred his horse, and he took off after the animal again. And he said, Abraham, Abraham. Were you born to do this? And he stopped. And he got off of his horse. And he walked his horse over to a shepherd that worked for his father. And he gave his father, he gave the shepherd the horse. And he took off his rich clothes and he gave the shepherd his rich clothes. And he took off his fine jewelry and he gave the shepherd his jewelry. And he took the shepherd's clothes and he put them on. And he walked toward Mecca, which was the Holy Land. All of this happened because the night before, he was sleeping. And the poem said, Abu Ben Adams, may your tribe increase. He awoke one night from a deep dream of peace. And he saw an angel in his room. He asked the angel when he was there. And the angel said he was writing the names of the people that loved the Lord. And he says, well, am I one? And he said, no, it's not so. But after that event, the angel came again. And he said to the angels, the angel showed him a list of all of the people that God had blessed. And Abraham, then Adam's name, led all the rest. And what that story tells us, that if we want to serve God, the best way for us to serve God is to serve one another. And if we serve one another, we serve God. So you should do everything you possibly can to do as much as you can for everyone, especially people who are less privileged than you are, because that's the essence of Christianity, is serving each other. So anyway, I grew up, and when I was six years old, my folks left uh, Alabama and, and uh, moved to Pennsylvania. and. Uh, that's where my father worked in the coal mines. And coal mining was very dangerous in those days because the mines would cave in, and there was methane gases, there were all kinds of, uh, oh, thank you, son. Thank you very much. There were all kinds of accidents. And the people would say many times, if, if the cave-ins and the gases don't kill you, you can always look forward to the black lung disease. Some people call it consumption. And the coal miners used to get this and they would spit blood. I would see my father coming home from the coal mines every day, wet with sweat and clothes that were black and dirty. And he'd come into the house. My mother would be heating water on the kitchen stove. She would bring a tub in from the back uh, porch and put it on the kitchen floor, and my father would get into the tub and take a bath. My mother would scrub his back. He, my father would come to the table and he would eat. 
And sometimes he had worked so hard during the day that he fell asleep while he was eating his dinner. That's what I saw. And I thought, is this going to be my life? Am I going to have to work like this and as hard as my father worked and, and, and be as poor as, my, my, as we are? And so I, I, uh, about that time, I met another man who was another angel to me. He was a man named Robert Lutton. And I used to deliver Mr. Lutton's newspapers to him. And Mr. Lutton was very good to me. He was a very kind man. And uh, uh, I'd stop in and talk to him. And the reason I would talk to Mr. Lutton, and this is very important, children, the reason I would talk to Mr. Lutton is because Mr. Lutton was a businessman. Mr. Lutton didn't come from the coal mines every day in dirty clothes, wet with sweat. He came to work every day in a white shirt and a white and a, and a necktie. And, uh, and when I looked at my father coming home from the coal mines, wet with sweat and, 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 and dirty uh, from the coal, and, uh, and he made, my father told me once that, that 19 to $20 a week for working in a coal mine was a good wage. And uh, here I saw this other man that uh, had a nice little business. He used to package soap, and uh, he sold it to people for 15 cents a box. He was the first entrepreneur that I had ever met. So I contrasted these two men. I looked at my father, who worked harder than anyone I think I've ever known, uh, and then I looked at this other man that, didn't, that had a beautiful and easy job, and I made a decision, and I hope you will make a decision too, and someday, I hope you will aspire to work for yourself and not to be an employee for other people. You have a choice. If you are an employee for other people, that's wonderful. Uh, and you'll get a good salary, that's wonderful. But if you really want to get ahead in life, you also, you always also ought to try to work some of the time of yours for yourself. Well, anyway, uh, I became a, uh, I would always finish my newspaper route at Mr. Lutton's store because I, I just love what I heard. I love what I saw. I mean, I'd never seen anybody work in clean clothes. You know, I thought if you worked, you had to be a coal miner. And uh, he's, he liked me. Later on, I gave a speech at Olivet University here in Michigan. And a lady, they published the speech, and a lady uh, called me and said, Mr. Barfield, she said, uh, Mr. Lutton was my uncle. I hadn't heard his name in 70 years. He's my uncle. And she said, the reason I think he loved you so much is because he never had a son of his own. But he loved me a lot. And so here I was taking the newspapers, and I would always stop at his little store, and I would say, and talk with him, because he was very kind to me. He was very nice. And I was amazed to see that this is how some people worked. So one day I said to him, Mr. Lutton, can I, can I help you in the store? And he used to sit back and, and, uh, and look, and, and he would say to me, well, now, Johnny, do you think you could do what I'm doing? And I said, yes, sir, I can do it. And uh, so next, before you know it, I was working in the store. I was sweeping the store up, and I was helping him put the powder. He would take the powder out of a big drum and put it in little boxes, like a crack, like a popcorn box. And he would sell it to people for 15 cents a box. So I learned to sweep the store. I could fill the bottom uh, boxes from these big drums and put them on the shelf. And I, I just thought I died and went to heaven. I mean, I was working. I quit my paper route, and I started working for Mr. Lutton. And then one day I said to him, Mr. Lutton, could I please uh, sell the soap to you? And he sat back, and he said, well, now, Johnny, do you think you could sell my soap? Yes, sir. So I fill my paper bag up full of soap. And I go, I had sense enough to go to where the white rich people live. And I'd go to East Washington and I'd knock on the door and the lady would come to the door and she'd see this little raggedy boy on her front porch and she would say, hi son, what can I do for you? And I would say, my name is Johnny Barfield. I sell clean and lean soap. Would you please buy some for me? And sometimes, you know, they would say to me, well, let's see, son, how many do you have left? And I would look and I'd say, I got 15 boxes. Let me buy them all. I can put them on my shelf. Well, you know, they were trying to help me because they saw I was hard working and poor. And I'd run back and get another bag full of soap. And I got a five cent commission for every box I sold. And that's when I became an entrepreneur. I found out when, when my
my friends were selling newspapers and walking all over town, I was learning to be a businessman when I was nine years old, and I was making a commission. And by the time that uh, I was 10 years old, I could run his shop as well as he could. And one of the things that I'm starting at Park Ridge Community College, and I hope all of you will participate in this, we're going to kick it off very soon. I'm going to start an entrepreneurial and leadership training program for children from 9 to 12 years old. Because that's when you should learn to be a business person, when you're young, not when you're grown. I'm on the advisory board at the University of Michigan for training uh, entrepreneurs, University of Michigan students. And I don't think I've ever seen one black student go through that in all the time I've been on that board, and I've been on for four or five years. And they're training these people, but these people are grown up when they get to be trained. And what we want to do is we want to meet our children when they were, my, as I, my age, when I was nine years old, that's when I became, uh, I had a desire to become an entrepreneur. Listen, son, listen, listen, don't you listen to me. Listen to me, this is very important. Okay, let me, t let me tell you something. I want you to listen, this is very important. You, the, you're going to grow up to get a job. Let me, let me just give you a little story. One time, I was with the Rotary Club, and they asked me if I'd go out to the Charl to the Maxwell Prison in Whitmore Lake. Is it the Maxwell? Maxie. Maxie Prison, Whitmore Lake. This was 40 years ago. And I went out there, and there was a room full of people. I think they were all black. Young men, beautiful young men. They were in jail. And I said, I was talking to them, and I could see they weren't interested in what I was saying. They were just there because they had to be there. And I figured if I'm going to get their attention, I, I'm going to, I've got to, I've got to get their attention or it's going to be a waste of all of our time. So I had an idea and I said to them, how many of you would like to have a business of your own? Now, this is very important. I want you to listen to it. And I got remarks like, oh man, how are we going to have a business of our own? Man, how we, we ain't got no money. We ain't got no this. We ain't got no, all that kind of talk. I said, you don't have to have a lot of money to start a business of your own. You just have to change the way you think. And so I went to the blackboard, and I said, this room is 400 square feet of carpet. If all of the furniture was out of this room, how long do you think it would take you to shampoo this carpet? Then they sit up in the seat, because they have been challenged. So, man, I could do that in five minutes. Man, I could do that in six minutes. And finally, we decided that it would take 15 minutes to shampoo that carpet. So I said, 15 minutes. If you can shampoo this carpet, in 15 minutes, and you got 400 square feet, and you got four, 15 cents for every square foot, you know how much money you would make? And they said, what? I said, you'd make $60. $60. And I said, how long did you say it would take you to do this? They all said, 15 minutes. I said, if you make $60 in 15 minutes, how much could you make an hour? And they said, $240. I said, I could teach you in one weekend how to make $240 in a weekend, an hour. That's how much you're worth. Now, if you want to continue to work for $9 an hour with minimum wage, that's up to you. But that's not what you're worth. That's what people say you're worth. But what you have to decide is, is what am I really worth? That's right. I worked for the University of Michigan for six years from 1949 to 1954. I made $1.75 an hour. That's what the University of Michigan said I was worth. And that's what I believe. So for six years I worked and I made $1.75 an hour. Then I married my wife and our family began to grow. And I said, if I'm going to give my children better opportunities than I had, and, be, and by the way, I had made a very mistake, big mistake, because I quit high school when I was in the 10th grade. The worst mistake I ever made in my life. I quit high school in the 10th grade. So, and then I, and when I was 16, and when I was, before I was 18, I was on a ship headed for Germany and France where I served as a soldier. I came back with no skills, so I had to take anything that they offered me, so I took a job as a janitor. Okay, and for six years I worked at that janitor for less than $2 an hour, $70 a week. But when I married and I realized that I had to make more money to support my family, I quit that job and I started cleaning houses. There were a lot of new houses. And the people that were cleaning those houses didn't want to do it because they thought this was beneath them. I saw it as an opportunity. What they saw as a curse, I saw as an opportunity. So I went to the builders of these homes, and I said, can I clean those houses for you? I can clean them better. I can clean them at less cost. I can clean them on time. And I can clean them in a way that you won't be 
uh, having problems from their customers. They gave me that. And after I cleaned a few houses, lots of people came to me and said, we want you to clean our houses. Then the president of the Ypsilanti Savings Bank called me one day and said, Johnny, I hear you do good work. I said, I do. He said, how would you like to clean my bank? And I said that I did. I would like to clean his bank. So that was the beginning of contract cleaning. That was the first contract job I had. And, and I cleaned that building. And from that time on, I figured I could go into business. But when I was cleaning the houses, I found out that I could clean two houses in a day. And I got $35 for every house I cleaned. So in a day, I made $70 working for myself. And, the, and when I worked for the university, I made $70 working in a week. So I found out that my time was not worth $70 a week. It was worth $350 a week. Mm -hmm. I learned the value of my time and my talents. That's what I want you to do. Because this is the only thing that will elevate the average person from being poor to being wealthy. When I learned the value of my time and my talents, then I went to the people that did these bigger places. Park Davis. Universal Airlines, Willow Run Airport, the power plants here. And I went to these people and I said, let me clean your place for you. And I started a cleaning company right here in Ypsilanti. In, in 13 years, I had built one of the largest contract cleaning companies in the state of Michigan. And I sold it to International Telephone and Telegraph in 1969 for one of the highest prices they'd ever paid for a contract cleaning company at that time. And I retired when I was 39 years old. <laughs> now, I'm telling you this because you can do the same thing. You, 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 if you are willing to use your, you're not paying attention, I want you to listen to me. You asked me to come over here, right? Did you? Yes, and you got to give me your attention and you got to listen to what I'm saying. Okay, so uh, if, if you want to have a better life, you know, and live in a better house, and drive a better car, and have money in the bank, then you might want to think about something other than working for someone else all of your life. You might want to think about working some for yourself. Let me tell you something. There's two kinds of salary. There's two kinds of wealth. There's the wealth that you get when you work for people. That's called ordinary income. And there's the wealth that you get usually when you work for yourself that's called meaningful wealth. And ordinary income is the reward for people who work for other people. If you work for General Motors or Ford or other people like that, and you get a good salary, but it's ordinary income. It's going to allow you to have a nice house and a nice car, and you'll have a mortgage and this, but it won't have you, it won't allow you to live the way you would like to live. But you, you're going to be living at this level, which is wonderful, it's good, but you want to live up here, right? So you have to figure out how to get there. You have to figure out how to get there. And, and uh, if you work for yourself, uh, you know, that's what we're doing at. And then, you know, a lot of people encourage people to become entrepreneurs, full-time entrepreneurs. That's wrong. Become an entrepreneur. Work for other people if you want to, but work for yourself, too. So some people say you should work eight hours a day. That's foolish. What's wrong with working 12 hours a day? If for those hours you're working to build your own wealth, you're working for yourself. Mm -hmm. Let sense. me tell you something. If you were a plumber or a carpenter and you worked for a company and they paid you $30 an hour, you'd be pretty happy with that. And you'd tell your friends, well, I make $30 an hour. You know what? And if you work 40 hours a week for 52 weeks, you're going to make $63,000 a year. That's good, right? Mm -hmm. That's a very good wage. I'm not complaining. But you know what happens? The company you work for, they buy you a time for $30 an hour, and they sell it to me or other people for $75 an hour. So for every hour that you work for them, they pay you 30, they make 45. Wow. Why don't you make that money yourself? You follow me? Mm -hmm. You get the, get the picture? There's nothing wrong with employment, I'm not saying that. But too many black people work for other people when we can do a lot of this for ourselves. True. And so that's what I'd like to teach our young people to do. You, we, we get, we are told that you get a good education, you work hard, you get a good job, you get promotions, you work 40 years and you retire. And that's good. That's what everybody does. But at the end of the retirement, you'll have, you won't have saved enough money to live the way you dreamed you would live because it's taken most of what you earn to, to, for 
provide your needs as you grow. So you want to find another way of doing it. Let me tell you something. In your whole lifetime, all of you, you're going to work a total of 84,000 hours. That's how many hours you have to work. This is your hourly lifetime inventory. The average person will make work, work 84,000 hours in a, in, 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 a, in a lifetime. And you know how we figure that? If you work, if you work eight hours a day, five days a week, 52 days a year for 40 years, it's 83,600 hours. That's the total amount of time that we will work in an average lifetime. Now, who you sell those hours to and how much you get for your hours determine whether you will be wealthy or poor. So what I'd like to teach our people, because we don't hear that message, is how to build meaningful wealth, not just ordinary income. Most, most people don't know the difference between ordinary income and meaningful wealth. There's a difference. The people that live in the finest houses in this city, have, they know how to make meaningful wealth. The people that live in other areas, they, have, they know how to make ordinary income. The problem is, when you get satisfied with making ordinary income, that's the end of it. You don't aspire to make meaningful wealth. So I want you to think about making meaningful wealth. So when you get grown, you drive a beautiful car, you live in a beautiful house, you send your children to the best schools, uh, you, you do that. And you can do this if you change your thinking and say, you know, I, I'm going to work towards becoming an employer rather than an employee. And if I become an employee, I'm going to do something else on the side. And what I do on the side is going to be what I'm going to use to build my meaningful wealth. Okay. It's all about getting ahead. So anyway, that's what I did. And uh, I, 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 I used to go, when I was cleaning houses, I used to go to the houses, some of the professors, and some of the uh, other people, and I'd look at their houses, and they lived in these beautiful homes, or beautiful lawns, and three-car garages, and when I cleaned their closets, I couldn't get over their clothes. I think, <laughs> you know, I felt, when I, and when I, my first house was on 2nd Avenue in Ypsilanti. I paid $500 for it. It had, it had been lived in by a lady, and she had gotten sick, and that house had been vacant for 12 years. And when I went there, there were eggs on the table that had been so long that they were all dried up. There were three or four dead cats in the house, uh, weeds were all up around the house. And, uh, and, and, you know, people had passed that house by for years, and nobody wanted it. And I saw it, and, and I said, oh, boy, that's a beautiful house. I saw what that house could become, not what it was. Follow me? you got to see what things can become, not what they are. And I went to the man that owned it. It was a white man that had bought it on the tax sale for $500. And I went to him, and, and I asked him, would he please sell me the house? And he said, no, I bought it as a, uh, I bought it as an investment. I'm going to fix it up and sell it. But every week I'd knock on his door, and I said, won't you please? I'll give you more than you paid for it. No, I told you I'm going to sell it. So one day I went to him, and I said, you know, I'm going to tell you that you're rich. You have everything you need. I don't have anything. I have a family, and I don't have anything. You don't need that house. Why don't you sell it to me? He said, okay. <laughs> and every time I see him after he said, you little booger, you wouldn't let me say no, would you? My point is, if you want something in life, you go after it. Don't take no for an answer. When I went to the University of Michigan, and I, and I went to my boss, and that's for a leave of absence, he said, no. No, I'm not going to give you a leave of absence. So I went to his boss, and I got a leave of absence. If I had taken, if I had listened to what he told me and not went farther, I would have still worked for the University of Michigan. Now let me tell you something that's really startling. Suppose I'd worked for the university I worked for them for six years. Suppose I'd worked there for them for 14 more years. That would have been 20 years, right? If they had given me an increase of five percent for every one of those 20 years, at the end of 20 years, I would have been making. $8,000 a year for 20 years. That's what I would have been making. Wow. How could I have sent my children to college? Mm -hmm. How could I have given my wife a better life? How could I have had a better life? It was a prescription for keeping me poor. So I left the university because I realized that I was worth more than they said I was worth. Okay. Let me tell you something really funny. When I was about six years old, we moved to Pennsylvania. We were playing in a, out playing cowboy Indians. I, I don't know if you guys do it anymore. We used to get a stick and put it between our legs and behind. <laughs> we thought we were a horse. You know. We'd be running around sometimes with a 
the cape on, you know, and we'd be the Phantom. You know, we just did that kind of cool stuff. And my cousin found a $20 bill, a $10 bill laying on the ground. He said, no, yeah, it was a $10 bill laying on the ground. And he picked it up. And we had never seen that much money in our life. And we were scared of it because we, we didn't know what to do with that much money. But one thing we did know, we couldn't tell our folks we found it because they would have took every penny from us. So we decided that we would split it up. Now, instead of them get, let me split it up, and I would have been fair. You know, I really would have been fair. Uh, they went and got his cousin, who was about 15, 16 years old. And because we were little and he was bigger, he thought he could take advantage of us. So he took us all up to the store, and we changed this in nickels and pennies and quarters and dimes. They brought us way back down in the woods and set us all in a circle like a bunch of Indians. And he sat in the middle, and he just began to give each one of us something. And every time he'd come to the boy that found it, you'd say, now I'm going to give him a little bit more because he found it okay. And all my kids, yeah, yeah. Well, he kept, when he finished, he had a big pile of money. And we all had, you know, a little bit. And I'm looking at my pile. And I'm looking at his pile. And I decided, and this is a good lesson for you, if, if I couldn't have what I was entitled to, I don't want anything at all. And that's the problem we have to do. If you can't, in life, if you don't get what you deserve, don't take anything. Don't let somebody just give you what they think you have, You should have. Don't take anything. And I didn't want it. So I got up and I said, I don't want it. And I started walking away. And, of course, they knew I was going to tell. And they, and they said, Johnny, come back. I'll give you more. No, I don't want any more. I mean, well, come on. I'll give you more. I said, no, just keep it. And I went straight home to my uncle. I said, Uncle Ernest, we found $10. And he got really excited. So I went back and I said, Uncle Ernest said, bring the money all to him. Now they're really mad at me. And uh, we went back there and Uncle Ernest took every penny. He didn't, none of us got anything. But I was standing looking at him and my cousin, who was bigger than I am, he balled up his fist and he looked at me and got my attention. He said, hmm? <laughs> 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 he, he said, what do you tell me? I'm going to beat you all over with you know, Uncle Ernest Lee. But, you know, you got to learn how to use your resources. So I called. I said, Uncle Ernest. He said, what is it, John? I was right. He loved me. He had he's got a bonus when he gets the $10. I said, James, he's going to really beat me up when you leave. He turned to his son, James, and he said, if you put one finger on John, I'm going to tear you up. Yeah. So I was safe. I, I, was, I was broke, but I was safe. <laughs> and my dignity was intact because... I, I didn't I, I didn't I didn't let someone tell me what I was worth. I said if I can't have what is if he had given me my fair share and if mine was equal, if everyone got the same amount, I wouldn't have said a thing. But because he tried to take advantage of me, I would do that. So don't let anyone try to take advantage of you. Don't take anything less than you're entitled to. If you're entitled to a dollar, don't take fifty cents. Okay? And so that's what I did, and I started the cleaning. And then I went from one business to the other. The business that we had until recently is called the Bartech Group. I started it in, in 1975. General Motors came to me and said, we'll offer you, we'll, would you be interested in cleaning up some old engineering drawings? And I said, I would be. He said, if you can prove to us that you can clean these drawings up, uh, in, in six months, to our satisfaction, we'll continue to give you work. At the end of the six months, we not only cleaned those up, but we're working for five other divisions of General Motors. And they liked what we did. And that was the beginning of the company in 1975 or 64. Today, that company has 3,000 employees, has operations in Belgium, England, the Czech Republic, Mexico, China, and the United uh, uh, Canada, and the United States. It has the responsibility for providing management oversight of 35,000 technical employees from Verizon, Citibank in New York, and other companies. And we have the responsibility of making sure that almost $3 billion of our client funds are managed properly. And uh, last year, in 2014, we were named the best managed services company in the world. Outperformed Kelly, Manpower, Adeco, and the others. Wow. So, So 
just because we started out poor, and I was raised in the projects of the NF's Atlantic Park Bridge, doesn't mean that we have to stay in that state. If we're willing to use our imagination, if we're willing to think for ourselves, if we're willing to think differently, we can be as successful as we want to be. As successful as we want to be. What is your name, Mr. Clay? Janine. Janine, I can show you how to have your own private label products, your own cosmetics. I, I, I know you like that. You're a pretty girl. I can tell you like your own cosmetics a lot. You can have your own lipstick. You can have all of the things that you can easily do. Sell that under your own private label. Uh, every, every, you know, and, and it's very easy to do that. It's not hard to do these things if you know how, if you know the mechanics, right? It's not hard to do those things. So what I'd like to do at Park Ridge, I'd like to start a program for, uh, to teach young people how to uh, aspire to have businesses of their own. Uh, and also to teach older people how to use their skills uh, to build more personal wealth. And I'm going to shut up now because I've talked a lot. And so if you have any questions, I'll let's those that will Yes. My other question would be, how would you dress your clothes? How did I dress? Uh, my mother made my clothes. My mother made my clothes because we, we couldn't afford to do things, so she would make my clothes. But I, I, I dressed ordinarily. I had more overalls, you know, like other kids did. But my mother was an old-fashioned mother. She made me patch my overalls. If I wore a hole in the knee, I had to patch it. And I had to do it right. She made me take the scissors, cut the hole out, get the ravels off, take another pair of overalls and cut a patch out. And I had to sew that patch in, but I had to turn it under so there were no raggedy edges. So I learned to do that. I also learned to cook. I taught my wife how to cook. By the way, I've been married 68 years. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. And, and, and my wife was my girlfriend for five years. So if I add the five to the 68, we've been together for 73 years. All right. All right. And let me tell you something about marriage. Let me tell you something about most important things that you will ever have in your life is your family, your faith, your health, and your friends. There, there, there are other things in life that people can have, but I want you to repeat after me. The most important things in all of our lives. The most important thing in all of our lives is our family. Is our family? Our faith. Our faith. Our health. Our health. And our friends. And our friends. If you keep this in mind, you'll have a balanced life. And let me tell you something. There are also principles. Uh, one principle that I always remember, that it's better to have a good name, and it's better to have a good reputation than it is to be rich. Let me tell you a story for, about what happened to me and my wife and the President of the United States, Richard Nixon, in 1969. In 1969, we sold our first business to it and they invited us to New York, and they put us up in one of the finest hotels in New York. First time I'd ever been to New York, and first time I'd been in one of those hotels. So we didn't know how to act. But when we got there, we couldn't get into the front door of the hotel because there was a mob of people that were not letting people in. And when they saw that we were just guests, they let us in. But there was one man that they did not let in, and that man was the president of the United States, Richard Nixon. He had to sneak in that night through the back door of the hotel, which proves the principle of the Bible that in that day, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Now, he had to go through the rear door of the hotel because he had lost his good name and his good reputation. He had been, he had been found to be a crook in Watergate, trying to do a lot of things he was found out. So he, he died. He was, he was impeached. He left his office in, in disgrace because he had not done the right thing. So it's always good to do, do the right thing. And it's good also not to ever become obligated to anyone. Most people that get in trouble, many people that get in trouble, get in trouble because they feel obligated. And it's also a good idea to have a mind of your own. Okay, my, 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 uh, okay. I thought my daughter was telling me to shut up. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, uh, I want you, I, I just, you're so beautiful looking at you, and you have so much potential that I don't want you to allow someone to uh, prevent you from reaching your fullest potential. 
I want you to have confidence in yourself and faith in yourself, and I want you to aspire to be just not order, someone ordinary, but to be something special. Now, if you have any questions, I, I will try to answer them. Yes, dear. What is your wife's name? Like, how does she, like, I'm Janine, and I think that you're Jay. Uh-huh. And, um, like, what does she, what does she do to you? Like, how does she react? Well, my wife was, without question, one of the most beautiful women you've ever seen in your life. In fact, people used to say, your wife looked like Lena Horne, and I said, no, Lena Horne looks like my wife. There you go. Uh, she was very beautiful. Uh, I, 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 in my book that I wrote, starting from scratch, I call her uh, my northern star. Do you know the story of the northern star? Okay. Well, my wife was my northern star. And uh, she, she, I have never had a partner that I admired more, that encouraged more than my wife. And in my life, I've seen young men that were full of themselves, talk about how many girlfriends they had, and I've seen a few men that were married that were not, uh, that, that did not have a pure and honest relationship, and I really felt sorry for them, because there's nothing in the world more beautiful than a beautiful marriage. There's nothing in the world more beautiful than beautiful children. And so I have always really admired my wife and appreciated her, and I would not be where I am today if I didn't, if she had not been beside me for every step of this journey. Uh, you know, it's, it's, in my church was, there was a man at Pentecostal, and they were testifying, I don't know, this man's wife must have cooked a nice meal or something, they came to church, and he said, brothers and sisters, the Bible says, if a man finds a good wife, he's found a good thing, and I've got a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, there's nothing better than a, than a family, and again, I said to you that the most important things in your life is your family, your faith, your love, and your friends. If you have that, you have balance in your life. So I, I, I love my wife. I gave a speech in Detroit to some young people, and I concluded the speech after talking about my wife by telling them that I love the God she walks on. And, uh, and when the speech was over, the young men came to me and said, uh, the young women came to me, oh, Mr. Barfield, that was beautiful. Thank you. And the young men came to me, oh, God, Mr. Barfield, you put some pressure on us today, you know. But there's nothing better than a good wife with her. not a complicated thing at all. Uh, you first start with an idea. And, and uh, once you have the idea, you, you, you make your business plans. And you talk to the people that you want to serve. And you convince them that you can provide the service they want at a price that they're willing to pay for. And that's all there is to it. That's all there is to it. It's not hard. A lot of people think that it's hard. But there are a few steps to, to starting and establishing one of the things that I hope to do, and I hope you all will participate in this entrepreneurial and leadership training program that we're starting, because it will do just that. It will teach you how simple it is to start a business of your own. It's not hard to do at all. Found at ten dollars. Oh, my cousin Clay. His name was Clarence. Clarence. What was Sorry. he like? Oh, they what, pushed, they must have pushed what was he like? Yeah. My cousin was was quite troubled. He uh, he used to have spells. You know, like he, they had sometimes they had to watch him very closely. He just start running. You know, and, and things more. Uh, he lived to be a, a, a old man, and he died. He was kind of pitiful. Uh, you've seen. But he was a he was a nice young man. We had to be nice those days we got tore up.
name is Chris Chandler. Uh, I'm playing as one of the guys who worked with you for the janitor job. And I was wondering how the other people that worked with you, how they acted while they were doing it. Like, how they, like what their personalities were like and how they acted like while you were doing the job. Well, they, they, they acted well. Which, they acted well because I acted well. They acted well as employees because I acted well as an employer. When I, when I first started my business in 1954, uh, there were no African-American businesses in this country, hardly ever. And there were hardly any businesses were owned by women. And I was one of the first people that started, an African-American started business in, in this country and in Ann Arbor. You know, if you, you know, and if, it's funny, you know where the, the banks are in downtown Ypsilanti? Okay, right across the street, you all would be too young to remember it, but is there anyone here that remember when there was a Shea Bar hardware store? Okay, I bought that building. Now, when I bought that building, it was very rare because um, in those days, the banks wouldn't even let black people in our area run and build a house there. But I had worked and I had saved some money. When I bought that building, it was, you know, a, a lot of people were really surprised that I had bought the building. Anyone remember the food and drug market? Yeah. I bought that building. Now people began to really sit up and watch me because they said, no, oh, this is a black man and he bought this building downtown. And then next thing they know, I bought the food and drug market building. And, and now people are really beginning to notice me. And then the next thing I did, I bought the Atlanta Press Bill on Mule Street. So now, you know, people are really looking now and they don't understand what's wrong. And then down by the paper mill, you know that big factory now that is uh, that yes. big brown I bought that building. I paid a million two hundred thousand dollars for it. Now remember, I started with nothing, but I learned how to. I learned how they did it. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I learned how they did it, and I did it too. So that I own that. So I had a lot of property in Ypsilanti, and then I hired my my people. And when you hire people, you have to people have to respect you, or they won't work for you. So I hired. A lot of African American people, and in those days, they weren't sure they wanted to work for me because they had worked for uh, a black company before. And in fact, there was a young man from Mississippi. I won't call his name because somebody might know it. But he worked for me, and he was he worked. He was 16, and he always called me Johnny. And uh, he always referred to the man he worked for down south as Mr. Mr. So and so. So one day, I I just kidded him. I said, well, you call him the man you worked for down south. So and so. Why don't you call me Mr. Mr. Johnny? And I said, no, I'm not going to call you Mr. Well, that was the way it, it was. So, but, but they had, but, but I had to win their respect. So, you know how I did that? I had the, the nicest office in all downtown. I ran my business as well as anyone. I ran it so impressively that one day the president of General Motors came and spent the whole day with me to see it. You know, I, if, if you can make people proud of you, and, if you, and, I, and the reason I was very, very careful to, to do everything that I could do to be successful, because I knew, and not only me, the other people too, I, we knew that if we failed, it was going to make it harder for the next people, because people could say, we gave them an opportunity, and look what they did with it. Mm -hmm. But they can't say that about us, that first group of me, because they gave me an opportunity for six people, and I grew it to 3,000. And, 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 and uh, so I made them, them, them very proud. And, and if you can surprise people by doing more than they think you can do, you will be very successful all of your life. Thank you very much. I, I, uh, I've enjoyed talking to you. I, I hope to get a chance for us to talk again sometime. Uh, did you understand the message that I was trying to tell you? Okay, don't, uh, don't settle for anything. Don't take any less than what you're worth. Don't always expect to work all of your life with someone else, aspire to own businesses of your own. And when you have a family, remember that the most important things in your life are your family, faith, health, and your friends. And don't forget to pray, right? That's right. Thank you. Kids probably couldn't do this, but I could sit here and listen to you until the sun went down. Me too. This is amazing <laughs> stuff. You are.
you're getting, and you don't even understand it really, but you're getting amazing words of wisdom. Not only are we honoring a man who started from nothing and achieved the kind of success that he's achieved, but he served his country and he served his community, and we say thank you. Thank you. I, I want to tell you one more very brief story. I wrote the book, it's called Starting from Scratch. It says, From Humble Beginnings to a $2 billion Enterprise. Now, I want to tell you something. I want you to listen. Remember I told you that always don't take just anything anyone wants to give you. Now, I want you to listen to this. This is an amazing story. Uh, when the book was written, and it, it, it really is a good book, and the reason it's a good book is written with defer, deference and humility. Uh, it's, it's not a book that tries to tell people how smart I am or how rich I am or anything like that. I wanted people to know that I am where I am by the grace of God. That's where we all are, by the grace of God. And we be, when we begin to think we are where we are by how smart we are or what we've done, you, we're, on a, we're on a very slippery trail. But let me tell you something. Now, I want to give you something. This is a very interesting story. I hope you remember this if you don't remember anything else. I went to the bookstore, and I said, uh, this book uh, is selling for $27.95. I said, if you sell my book, how much royalty, what would you give me for selling the book? What do you think they offered me? $4. You're right. <laughs> they offered me $4.75. Now, what do you think the other $23 went? Well, did they do anything? They didn't do nothing. <laughs> okay. It's all about exploitation, right? So I'm here I've worked three years to write this book. And uh, it's, so, it's selling for $27.95. And they said, well, Mr. Barfield, we'll give you $4.50 for the book. You know what I said? The same thing I said when we found the $10 bill. If I can't have what I'm due, I don't want anything at all. So I don't sell the book through the stores. But I went to the Rotary Foundation. Rotary Foundation, uh, in 1956, decided that they were going to work to eradicate polio throughout the world. And we are that close to doing that now. Uh, within the next year, Lord's willing, there won't be any polio anywhere in the world because this organization did it. You don't know what polio was, but it was a very crippling disease. And sometimes it made people walk like animals. I mean, they would drug themselves, they were crippled. Uh, it, it was a terrible disease. So what I did is say, I, I went to the Rotary Foundation. Listen to this. This is called Using Your Mind. I, I used it when I started the business because the university said that I was worth uh, $1.75 cent. I was worth uh, $2 an hour. I found that out was worth much more than that. So I went to the Rotary Foundation and I said, if you will endorse my book to your 1.2 million members, and if you will encourage them to buy the book, I'll give you $15 for every book they buy. I would rather give them the $15 than to give it to some, some, some rich guy who is not doing anything. Because the $15 I gave them was going to fight polio right. and it's going to cure children. Right. Now, I got that idea and, uh, 40 years ago. I was a member of the Ipsland Rotary Club. And I went to the Rotary Club, and at that time, polio was ravaging in Africa. African kids were dying by the thousands. And I went to them and I said, let's start a program to raise enough money to provide vaccinations for a million African children. They said, if you, if you will lead the charge, we'll do it. The first gift I got was $100,000 from the Herrick Foundation. Well, at the end of two years, we raised enough money to provide vaccinations for 497,000 African kids. Wow. Wow. Yeah. 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 So when I wrote the book, I wrote the book, I went to the Rotary Foundation and said, if you will endorse this book and encourage your people to buy it, uh, I, I want to raise enough money to finish that goal and, and provide vaccination for another 500,000 children. And they said they would. So I said, I'll give you $15 for every book, $27 book that they buy. And they called me, uh, told me the other day that the, the Bill and the Melinda Gates Foundation was going to match that two for one. So for every book that is sold to a Rotarian, 
forty five dollars goes to fight polio throughout the world in september of this year lord's willing me and my daughter, my granddaughter, and my assistant, Brandon Marsh, plan to go to Evanston, Indiana, and give them a $90,000 gift, $30,000 from us, and $60,000 from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and that'll buy a Napoleon vaccine to provide vaccinations for another 500,000 children throughout the world. And I will have completed the goal that I started 40 years ago of providing Polio protection for one million children. Wow. All right, all right. So you you can be as big as you want to be. You can think as big as you want to think, or you can think as small as you want to small think. But if you want to have a better life, don't just be content to make ordinary income. Be content to build meaningful wealth. God bless you. Thank you. Again, I want to thank you so much. Um, I think I asked you if it was okay for us to honor you as our giants almost a year ago, last June. And you said, you said uh, yes, and we thank you for that. And we want to give um, Maria Johnson a hand because she wrote your section, well, she wrote the script, but she read your book thoroughly and uh, created this, your, your, your section for us. So thank you, Maria. But I'd like for us to take a picture with Mr. Um, Mr. Barfield. So hold on. Um, I need somebody to coordinate, organize this. Who can do it? Kenyatta.
this way. Look this way. way. And say cheese. <laughs> Mr. Meyer. Do me, do me. It's not like Mr. Nicola Big smiles and, and three, two, one. Great, thank you.